Europe, England, London Heathrow, the world's busiest international airport. January 8th, 1989. It's a Sunday evening, and many passengers are headed home after the Christmas and New Year holidays. The airport is packed. In Terminal 1, passengers check in for British Midland Flight 092 to Belfast, Northern Ireland. It's a regular, hour-long commuter shuttle. Security is tight. It's the height of the IRA's terrorist campaign against British targets. The IRA has killed 416 civilians in nearly 20 years of violence. Healthcare worker Gareth Jones started a new job in Belfast three weeks ago. Security checks are a way of life. If you lived in, in Northern Ireland at the time, you got quite used to security. It was a period when there was heightened security there. You look after these things, right? You look after mother. Thank you. Bye. The IRA isn't the only reason for Heathrow's high security. Lockerbie, Scotland. Three weeks earlier, a terrorist bomb blows apart a Pan Am 747 flying from Heathrow to the US. The explosion kills all 259 people on board and 11 more on the ground. It's the worst ever terrorist attack on a US airliner. The authorities suspect it's the work of an Arab terrorist group. Today, the passengers on flight 092 are in the hands of 43-year-old Captain Kevin Hunt. He's one of British Midlands' most experienced pilots, with 25 years flying under his belt. Air conditioning and uh, pressurization packs on flight. Flying with him, 39-year-old First Officer David McClelland. Tonight, they're flying an aircraft just two months old. It's one of Boeing's new 737-400 series. Boeing launched the aircraft a year earlier in a blaze of publicity. It boasts significant improvements over its predecessors. Its new CFM 56 engines are the most powerful of their kind. And the cockpit display features state-of-the-art technology, including computerized TV screens and LED dials, which replace the traditional mechanical gauges. 7.15 p.m. Boarding cars, please. 118 passengers board the brand new plane and take their seats. Brakes release, then you are clear to push, we're going to start engines two and one on push. Captain Hunt starts up the two engines. The 400 series aircraft is still new to him. He's clocked just 23 hours. First Officer McClelland has 53 hours. All pressure rising. Seat belt's on there, sir. In the main cabin, Gareth Jones has a window seat over the wing in an emergency exit row. Excuse me, sir. Hi there. A flight attendant asks Gareth to read the safety card so that he knows how to open the overwing exit door. Normally it was pretty blasé about it, but it was pleasantly done and um, it would have been ill-mannered not to. Air traffic control clears flight 092 for takeoff. 092 is clear for takeoff, 27 right, surface winds 270 degrees. Weather conditions are perfect. Have to go? Let's go. First Officer McClelland throttles the engines up. D1, rotate. Positive climb. And gear up. Gear up. 7.52 p.m. British Midland Flight 092 is airborne and on its way to Belfast. Debbie Griffith, age 24, is one of six cabin crew on board tonight. She was on standby, but managers called her in at short notice. She's been a flight attendant for two years. I loved the job, basically because I, I really enjoyed meeting the people. It was, a, it was a great lifestyle for somebody of that age. Within minutes of takeoff, the cabin crew start the drink service. 
With the hold-ups behind them, there's a light-hearted atmosphere. Passengers know they'll be on the ground in under one hour. Eight o five p.m. Thirteen minutes into the flight, the aircraft is climbing through eight thousand five hundred meters on its way to a cruising altitude of ten thousand six hundred meters. Then, without warning, a massive bang. The aircraft starts to vibrate violently. A routine flight turns into every air traveler's worst nightmare. Up on the flight deck, Captain Hunt and First Officer David McClellan feel the vibration. Much worse, they smell smoke. What's going on? We've got, we've got a fire coming. Tell ATC we need to start at this end. Smoke can only get into the cabin by the air conditioning ducts. And since the aircon is jet powered on the 737, they deduce its engine trouble. And it sounds serious. 20 year old student Kieran Dynan is sitting over the wing close to the engine. All he can hear is a loud clattering sound. There was a very definite grinding noise. It sounded like heavens going on in the washing machine. Just back from the cockpit, in row one, are business partners Nick Stevenson and Chris Thompson. They're on their way home to Belfast. They feel the vibration. It's so intense, they fear the aircraft is breaking up. It sounded to me as though there's somebody outside with a sledgehammer trying to get into the aircraft, trying to beat their way through the fuselage. At that point, he simply stopped, froze. Flight attendant Debbie Griffiths immediately thinks of the Lockerbie disaster. This instant sort of terror, if you like. And my first thought was, is there a bomb? A huge bang and heavy vibrations rock a British Midland flight en route to Northern Ireland. Sitting in a window seat over the wing in row 14 is healthcare worker Gareth Jones. He's busy dealing with a panicking fellow passenger. The lady that was next to me, Teresa, was distressed, so I started to talk to her to, to try and, and, and calm her, but also to help me, because it wasn't uh, stress-free for me either. Gareth has good reason to be worried. His seat gives him a clear view of the plane's wing. And what he sees fills him with foreboding. I could look out of the window and see a trail of spark-like emissions from where the engine would be. From their seats in the cockpit, Captain Hunt and First Officer McClellan can't see either of the two engines, so they don't know about the sparks. Like all pilots, they must rely on their cockpit instrument display to diagnose the problem. The new display on the 400 series 737 is unfamiliar to them, but it's state-of-the-art technology. Hunter McClelland scanned the screens and LED instruments. They diagnose an engine problem and shut down the faulty engine. Back. Hey. Okay, shall I go through the, uh... the terrible clunking and vibration immediately cease. The 737 is now behaving normally again. But safety rules call for the crew to land the plane as soon as possible. Let's get a turn going for East Midlands. Hunt is in luck. Air traffic control clears him for an emergency landing at East Midlands Airport, just 10 minutes flying time away. Control, fly heading 090, be vetering for the ILS. Uh, Roger, Midland 92, descending flight level 120. 8.10 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Captain Kevin Hunt. Maybe aware we've uh, had a problem with uh, the aeroplane. Uh, the captain goes on the intercom to calm his 118 passengers and to tell them he shut down the malfunctioning engine. Uh, we are uh, on port there for an able to continue our flight into Belfast. He says they'll be safely on the ground in 10 minutes. We should be perfectly routine landing, as I say. Gareth Jones is relieved to see that the problem engine has stopped throwing out sparks. He's convinced the captain now has everything under control. 8.17 p.m. 
The aircraft descends through 2,000 meters. They're eight minutes from touchdown. So one, one six zero, one six zero, zero flight level four, four zero. Four zero and, uh, one minute later, air traffic control tells Captain Hunt to make a right turn to line up with the runway. Midland 092, descend to altitude 3,000 feet. Midland 092, descend up to 3,000 feet. Okay. They're on final approach. The cabin crew take their seats for the remaining few minutes. Eight twenty PM. Another, even louder bang rocks the aircraft. The passengers realize that the noise must come from the plane's last remaining engine. The whole plane shook. It was like something touched the plane, stopped it in midair, and at that point, frankly, my blood just went cold. Now there are more vibrations, worse than ever. The vibration was incredible. It was almost impossible for me to focus on Chris, who was sitting in the seat beside me. And I remember thinking, if this keeps vibrating like this, the aircraft is going to fall apart. Being absolutely terrified, not really knowing what was going on. Get down. Uh, Air traffic control clears Captain Hunt to descend to 600 meters. They must get the plane down and fast before their last engine fails altogether. Cross is going. Tell them we're going to pull the other engine. Then everything goes silent. The plane's last engine has given out. The passengers now know they're going down. I actually can't remember the noise of wind going, going by the plane, just this sort of rushing sound. And the plane then dropped. It started just to go down, like going over the top of a roller coaster. I remember thinking to myself, well, there's nothing you can do about it. If him upstairs wants to take you now, Captain Hunt has lost both engines. With no forward thrust, the plane is now fighting a losing battle with gravity. Hunt orders the first officer to try to restore power. McClelland begins the reignition sequence, but they're losing height rapidly. Now the left engine catches fire. She's not going. The 737 is dropping out of the sky. Captain Hunt's control column starts to shake violently. The ground proximity warning system tells him he's coming down too quickly. The pilots can see the airport runway lights less than two kilometers away. But there are more lights closer to the plummeting plane. The lights of the M1 motorway, the UK's major north-south artery. If they crash on the motorway, the death toll could be horrendous. But Captain Hunt is all out of options. The ground is coming up fast. Somebody on board said, Jesus, we're all going to die. 8.24 p.m. British Midland Flight 092 is just one minute from East Midlands Airport. Captain Hunt can see the runway lights, but he's lost both engines and one's on fire. His only hope, to keep the aircraft airborne long enough to crash land on the runway. The passengers haven't heard from the captain for 10 minutes, but they know they're going to crash. Stupid thoughts go through your head, like who's going to cut the grass? Part of your brain is saying, this, this plane's crashing. And part of it was saying, it can't be, because it doesn't happen. Now, Captain Hunt can see the village of Kegworth. Okay. Desperate to avoid crashing into it, he raises the nose to stretch the glide. The 737 passes over the village at an altitude of just 60 meters. Where have I noticed? what I think was a church spire, which actually went by the window. And I sort of thought, a church spire going through, going past the window, I'm in a plane. But beyond Kegworth, 
lies the M1 motorway. If Captain Hunt can get across this six-lane road, the safety of the runway is just 900 meters away. Get that. Just get on the other one. Get it going. She's not going. Get it up. She's not going. But he can't keep the plane airborne any longer. He makes a final announcement to the terrified passengers. She's not going, Kevin. Prepare for crash landing. Prepare for crash landing. And he said, brace, 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 prepare for crash landing. And the tone of his voice said it all. Uh, I can remember going into the brace position and just thinking, this is it. Just before the plane hit the ground, I remember thinking, nobody survives a plane crash. I wonder, will I? Thirty meters before the motorway, the tail section hits the ground and bounces back into the air. The plane smashes through trees near the edge of the motorway. It was horrendous. It just seemed to go on forever. It sort of sucked the breath out of you. It careens across the road, destroying a light on the central reservation. The aircraft slams into the embankment on the far side of the M1 and breaks into three. It is from being crushed and crushed and then nothing, total silence. It comes to rest just 900 meters from the safety of the runway. Captain Hunt made it across the motorway just. Incredibly, no cars are passing at the moment of the crash. Inside the wreckage of the 737's middle section, Gareth Jones and his fellow passenger Teresa are alive. They're sitting over the wing, the strongest part of the aircraft. Gareth is not even badly hurt. He cannot believe his luck. But the danger isn't over yet. When I opened my eyes, I could see the little bush that was on fire and thought, um, hang on, this is dangerous. We're right over the wing, the wing's full of fuel. Um, we'd better get out of this place pretty quick. It's a miracle the plane's 5,000 plus liters of aviation fuel haven't caught fire. But the fuel is now pouring out of the damaged wings and one of the engines is still in flames. If the fuel ignites, Gareth and any other survivors will have little chance. Having lived through an air crash, they could still burn to death. Gareth desperately pulls the emergency door handle, but it won't open. Fortunately, I remembered um, Jamie's instructions on the card and grabbed the handle, pulled the door in and threw it out. Before the crash, Gareth told fellow passenger Teresa that if they survived the impact, he would get her out. I remember sticking my head back in through the hatch and shouting to Teresa, give me a hand, and this little hand appeared out of the blackness. And I remember pulling her out through the door. Now Gareth climbs back into the plane to look for other survivors. He finds a horrifying scene. Twisted wreckage, injured people shouting for help, and others who are ominously silent. There were people clearly struggling to get out and others that were not moving. And you knew what had happened to those that were not moving. And that's one of the, the memories that carry with me to my grave. In row one, in the plane's broken front section, business partners Nick Stevenson and Chris Thompson. Chris is unconscious and severely injured. But Nick is one of the luckier ones. He comes round quickly. The first thing I thought is, I'm alive. The second thing I thought is, there's going to be a fire, get out. He doesn't have the strength to help Chris. He tries to get up, but a searing pain in his left leg stops him. And yet he knows he must overcome the pain to get out. You know, the survival instinct just takes over the drive. It's incredible. I just knew I was going to get out. I had to get out. Nothing else was of any importance whatsoever. He reaches a break in the fuselage and shouts to passing drivers who've stopped to help. He said, yeah, we see you, you're okay. You know, we'll get you. Carry me down the embankment. Still trapped in the wreckage of the nose section, flight attendant Debbie Griffith. She's in a bad way, 
but her main fear is a fuel explosion. I was having real problems breathing and actually felt like I was dying. I was really sort of fighting to live. And I just expected the engines to go. And I can actually remember thinking it hurts to me quickly. And 20-year-old Kieran Dynan hangs right over the edge of the shattered midsection. He's badly injured and drifts in and out of consciousness. All the seats in front of me were gone. There's nothing. It was just debris and nothing. 8.30 p.m. Five minutes after the crash, the fire crews reach the aircraft. They start to douse the whole area with foam. The fireman shouted through, we've got the engines out. So at least then I knew that we were in with a fighting chance. Within two minutes, the engine fire is out. The rescue can begin. Now firefighters scour the plane for survivors. They have the grim task of checking which passengers are dead and which still have a spark of life. I literally just woke up as he shone the torch light in my eyes and he said, quick, this one's still alive. And then I blacked out again. Kieran is pulled out of the plane and rushed to hospital. Eight hours after the crash, rescuers pull the last survivor from the wreckage of British Midland Flight 092. The time is 4.20 in the morning. Of the 126 people on board, the impact kills 39. Eight more die in hospital from their injuries. Among the survivors, the two pilots, David McClelland and Captain Hunt. Both are seriously injured by the impact. Captain Hunt is paralyzed. The survivors have been describing what happened and praising the skill of the plane's pilots. But what could cause a brand new aircraft to simply fall out of the sky? Sabotage by terrorists is one possibility. It's just three weeks since a Pan Am 747 exploded in mid-air above the village of Lockerbie in Scotland, killing 270 people. Did a terrorist bomb down this plane too? Now, by rewinding the bay and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened on Flight 092. Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can go, into the heart of the disaster zone. Eddie Trimble is the chief investigator from the UK's Air Accident Investigation Branch. He's worked on all the major air disasters in the UK over the last 30 years. When news of the Kegworth disaster breaks, Trimble's team of nine crash investigators is still in Lockerbie, scouring the wreckage of the downed Pan Am plane. Now he fears another terrorist outrage has claimed lives on British soil. Trimble arrives at the crash scene around midnight, just four hours after the accident. As the hours pass, he finds none of the telltale signs of damage from explosives. The team quickly rule out a terrorist attack as the cause of the crash. This is not another Lockerbie. Investigators now turn to the possibility of mechanical failure. Survivors report a double engine failure. It seems almost incredible, but the theory soon surfaces in news reports. The experts say the chances of both engines on a brand new airliner failing at the same time are a hundred million to one. But that seems to be what happened last night. Eddie Trimble knows that if both engines failed almost simultaneously, the implications are enormous. There are 18 of the new 737s in service. Could they all be flying with a fatal flaw? The investigators need to find out, and fast. Chief Investigator Eddie Trimble and his team of nine scour the crash site of British Midland Flight 092. They desperately need clues to explain what could cause both the 737's jet engines to fail. Accounts of the plane's final moments are coming in from eyewitnesses. 
they report flames in the left-hand engine. Trimble starts to probe the left engine. It's not an easy job. The crash impact seriously damaged it. But he soon finds something that's clearly not crash-related. The fan blades. Most of them are severely damaged or fractured. Trimble concludes that the fan blade fracture threw debris deep inside the engine. The resulting damage was fatal. He must send the left engine for further tests to discover what caused the fan blade to fracture in the first place. Now Trimble and his team turn to the right-hand engine. The one the cockpit voice recordings reveal is the first to malfunction. They carry out an inspection of its internal mechanisms. After hours of examination, Trimble reaches a terrible but inescapable conclusion. I thought, gosh, it really does look as though they may have shut down a good engine. Trimble realizes that when the left-hand engine starts to go wrong, the flight crew inexplicably shuts down the perfectly good right-hand engine. Now the whole focus of the investigation shifts. It's not a terrorist bomb or double engine failure that killed 47 people on flight 092. It's a catastrophic human error. This astonishing discovery rocks the aviation world. How could such experienced pilots shut down the wrong engine on a brand new aircraft? Trimble knows that the plane is one of the new 737-400 series launched a year earlier. First Officer McClelland has flown just 53 hours on the 400 series. Captain Hunt, even fewer only 23 hours. Could the pilot's unfamiliarity with some aspect of the new design have caused the fatal error? To find out, Trimble must probe every twist and turn of events on flight 092. Using the cockpit voice recordings, he starts to analyze every decision the pilots took on the flight deck. Okay, we're just turning off the localized. Column one fully established. Finland 092 is fully established. 8.05 p.m., just under 20 minutes before the crash. On the left engine, a fan blade fractures. The broken piece lodges inside the engine casing. The damage to the fan blade throws the finely calibrated engine out of balance. The engine now starts to shudder violently, setting up a vibration that rocks the whole plane. The fracture fatally damages the left-hand engine. It's now just a matter of time before it fails altogether. The flight crew feel the vibration and smell smoke escaping through the damaged engine seals into the air conditioning duct. They wrongly assume there's a fire in one of their two engines. Captain Hunt asks which is the problem engine. Which one? Which one? The cockpit voice recorder reveals the first act in a terrible chain of events. First Officer McClellan starts to say left, but then changes his mind. No, it's the right one. Eddie needs to find out why McClellan hesitates and then gets it wrong. He knows that the pilots can't physically see the engines. They must rely on their instrument display to diagnose the problem. The cockpit display on the new 400 series boasts LED dials and screens in place of traditional mechanical instruments. Did Hunter McClelland have trouble interpreting its unfamiliar instrument display? Okay, we're probably back. The new display has a meter to monitor unusual vibration on each engine. He should allow the pilots to see at a glance which engine is in trouble. The meters have always been a feature of the 737 cockpit display, but on the 400 series they look very different. On the new 737, the engine vibration meter has an LED needle. It swings around the outside of the dial instead of the inside as in earlier versions. And it's only the size of a 20 pence piece. 
Trimble learns that Hunter McClelland went on a one-day course to learn about the new 400 series. But he finds that neither of them received any simulator training on the Engine Instrument System, or EIS. My other pilot had had the opportunity to fly a simulator and learn how to interpret uh, the EIS, uh, whether in normal operation or, very importantly, during abnormal operation. The crew's unfamiliarity with the new plane means they lose their first opportunity to diagnose the problem correctly. But it's still a mystery why they reach the conclusion that it's the right-hand engine that's malfunctioning. The cockpit voice recordings give Trimble another clue. Can you smell that? What is that? It's definitely something. Smell something. When the pilots smell smoke from the damaged engine, they know the only way it can reach the cockpit is via the air conditioning system. Can you smell that? It's far coming through. In Captain Hunt's experience, the air conditioning on a 737 is powered by the right hand engine. Which one is it? No, no. He assumes. That is where the smoke is coming from. Well, probably back. Probably back. But Boeing has made another change to the latest 737. On the new planes, the air conditioning is powered not just by the right engine, but also by the left-hand engine. 8.07 p.m. Misled by the smoke, the pilots miss their second chance to diagnose the left-hand engine as the problem. Now, First Officer McClelland throttles back and shuts down the perfectly functioning right-hand engine. Everything seems to return to normal. The heavy vibration and banging has stopped. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Captain Kevin Hunt. If you've been aware in the cabin, we've, uh, we've had some smoke. A relieved Captain Hunt even goes on the intercom to tell passengers what he's done. But Hunt's mention of the right engine confuses many passengers. Student Kieran Dynan recalls seeing sparks and flames coming out of the engine on the left-hand side of the plane. I thought it was strange. Why is he turned off the good engine? It was so, so obvious this engine is all on fire. But Captain Hunt and the first officer cannot physically see either of the two engines from the flight deck. Someone from the passenger cabin would have to tell him which engine is in trouble. Investigators want to know why Kieran Dynan and other worried passengers don't raise the alarm. I remember thinking, he still must know what he's doing because he's the professional. Trimble and his team conclude that this trust in the captain prevents anyone on board from raising the alarm. But the investigators still face a big mystery. Why does the aircraft seem to return to normal function after the pilots turn off the wrong engine? To solve this mystery, Eddie Trimble and his engineering specialists delve deep into the workings of the 737's jet engines. All 737s have an auto throttle, a form of cruise control that maintains the desired airspeed by automatically sending the right amount of fuel to the engines. To shut down the engine, First Officer McClelland must disengage the auto throttle. This returns the plane to full manual operation and allows him to start throttling back the engine. Trimble suspects that this routine step holds the key to the mystery. He turns to the plane's black box to try to find out exactly what's going on inside the computer-controlled engines at the critical moment. What Trimble discovers about the behavior of the autothrottle explains why the plane appears to fly normally on a badly damaged engine. It's a major breakthrough. The investigation team can now unravel exactly what happened aboard Flight 092 in the final fateful seconds from disaster. 8.05 p.m. When the fan blade fractures on the left engine, its fragments damage the engine severely, causing a reduction in fan speed. The auto throttle reacts by pumping more fuel to the stricken engine, trying to maintain the fan speed. 
This causes the damaged engine to shudder violently and throw out sparks. These ignite surplus fuel, causing the flames seen by the passengers. 8.07 p.m. Misled by the smoke coming through the air conditioning, the crew misdiagnosed the problem engine. Captain Hunt orders the fully functioning right hand engine to be shut down. Okay, throttle it back. First Officer McClelland disengages the auto throttle and instantly pulls back the thrust lever on the right engine. The minute he does so, the vibration stops and the smell of smoke disappears. Eddie Trimble now knows why. Data from the black box reveals that when the pilots disconnect the auto throttle in order to shut down the right engine, both engines return to manual throttle. Sensors inside the damaged left engine detect that it's spinning slower than normal, which triggers a reduction in fuel flow. With the fuel flow now at a level the engine can handle, the vibration and flames disappear. Now the left engine appears to be functioning normally, when in fact it's fatally damaged. The crew naturally think they've shut down the correct engine. What they don't realize is that it is disconnecting the auto throttle that solves the problem, not, as they believe, closing down the right-hand engine. That particular effect of the auto throttle was the clincher which caused both pilots to believe that in retarding the right engine, they had identified the engine which was malfunctioning. It's a revelation to the investigators that the behavior of the 737's auto throttle might mislead pilots during an engine malfunction. And investigators are about to discover how a last terrible twist of fate snatches away the final chance to save flight 092. They're ready to be closing the localizer from the right. Eddie Trimble has one piece of the puzzle still to fit. Why did the flight crew not notice that they'd shut down the wrong engine in the 20 minutes they had between the initial crisis and crashing? Trawling through every nuance in the cockpit voice recordings, Trimble finds a poignant moment. 12 minutes and 15 seconds to disaster. The plane seems to be back to normal, but Captain Hunt's training tells him that after an in-flight crisis, it's essential to review all decisions to make sure no mistakes were made. What did we actually get? We got, we got vibration. But just as he starts his review, air traffic control interrupts him. The surface wind is indicating westerly at five knots. They clear Captain Hunt to descend to 1,200 meters for landing in 12 minutes time. He does not resume the review of events with his first officer. Had he continued, he may have spotted his error. But tragically, the crew miss their last chance to prevent the crash. Four minutes and 40 seconds to go. We can arm approach now. Yes, Shane, we'll take flaps one, please. Uh, speed one, my team. The pilots increase throttle to the left engine to control their descent. What they don't realize is this act will deal the engine its fatal blow. Increasing the fan speed throws more debris from the fractured fan blade deep into the engine. Thrust is going. Losing the thrust. Okay. Tell them we got a problem. It's the now way. tearing itself apart, and the runway is still 21 kilometers away. One minute to go. The engine loses all power. It now catches fire. It's got a fire in the number one engine. No, forget that. Just get the other one. Get it going. Captain Hunt has run out of time. He's lost both engines. In desperation, he tries to restart the right-hand engine with a windmill start, using the plane's speed to spin up the engine blades. She's not going. Get it up. She's not going. Life flow. She's not going, Kevin. Life flow. But it's too late. Their airspeed is too low. Hunt pulls the nose up to stretch the glide. He keeps the aircraft in the air long enough to clear the village of Kegworth. But Captain Hunt knows it's all over. 
10 seconds from impact. Captain Hunt makes his final announcement. Well going, Captain. Prepare for crash landing. Prepare for crash landing. At 8.24 and 43 seconds, British Midland Flight 092 crashes into the motorway embankment at 185 kilometers per hour. Midland 092, this is East Midlands Radar, do you read? Midland 092, this is East Midlands Radar, do you read? Midland 092, East Midlands, do you read? The plane comes to a stop just 900 meters from the airport runway. But five months after the crash, there's a final twist in the tale. A shocking discovery that grounds more than 30 of Boeing's brand new 737-400 aircraft worldwide. June 1989, five months after the Kegworth crash, two more Boeing 737-400 series aircraft suffer identical fan blade fractures in flight. In both cases, the pilots read the signs correctly and land safely. The Civil Aviation Authority has tonight grounded all Britain's Boeing 737-400 aircraft. Aviation authorities around the world ground all planes with the same type of engine for urgent inspection. CFM, the engine's manufacturer, discovers a design fault in the fan blades. Running at maximum power above 7,600 meters, the low air density sets off a previously undetected vibration in the blades. The resulting stress can lead to fractures. It emerges that the engine was never tested in flight. The 737-400 aircraft and its engines are an upgrade of the 300 series. The engine was only bench tested in a laboratory. A flight test was not mandatory. If it had been, the potentially catastrophic vibration effects on the blades might have been detected. The engine manufacturer has to redesign the engine and refit 99 400 series aircraft. Aviation regulations now require manufacturers to flight test all new engines. Just over 18 months after the Kegworth air crash, the Air Accident Investigation Board publishes its report. It concludes that although the pilots made an error in shutting down the wrong engine, there were mitigating factors. The pilots had received no flight simulator training for the 737-400 series. That meant the first time they faced an emergency, it was for real. The vibration meters weren't prominent enough. And if a member of the cabin crew had alerted the captain to the flames coming from the left engine, which he couldn't see from the cockpit, the crash could have been averted. But for the survivors, the flight crew are heroes. It was just very, very sad that it was so, so close to have made it. And you know, to have those two pilots put at such risk and to have worked so hard to have got so close. It, it, it's upsetting. The lessons learned from the Kegworth crash have had a wider impact on aviation safety. Boeing redesigned cockpit displays for new aircraft, making them easier to interpret. Simulator training is now mandatory if the design of an aircraft changes substantially. And airline training around the world now emphasizes and encourages full communication between cabin and flight crews, particularly during an in-flight emergency. Of the 126 passengers and crew on board, 47 lost their lives. For the survivors, nothing can erase the memory of that dreadful night. But they have rebuilt their lives. Chris Thompson and Nick Stevenson both recovered from their injuries. They're still in business together in Northern Ireland. Kieran Dynan is now married with a young daughter. You know, you still worry about things, but I don't worry anymore. I think all my bad luck came at once, and there's nothing ever as bad is going to happen again. Debbie Griffith left the airline industry to train as a nurse. You can't go through a plane crash without changing. It's made me live for the moments. I've always been fairly happy-go-lucky. 
but I've never felt bitter. I've never felt, why me? Why not me? Um, I'm nothing special. Gareth Jones's physical injuries on the nights were minor, but the emotional scars are still with him. You did feel dirty afterwards that, you know, why me? Why did I survive? What had I done that was special? Um, and to a degree that loses me to this day. I don't know why I, I escaped, apart from picking a lucky seat. The Boeing 737 is still the world's most popular aircraft. Today, a 737 takes off somewhere in the world every five seconds. Its safety record is one of the best in aviation. It's sitting over the wing, close to the engine. All he can hear is a loud, clattering sound. There was a very definite grinding noise. It sounded like heaven's going on in a washing machine. Just back from the cockpit, in row one, are business partners Nick Stevenson and Chris Thompson. They're on their way home to Belfast. They feel the vibration. It's so intense, they feel the aircraft is breaking up. It sounded to me as though there was somebody outside with a sledgehammer trying to get into the aircraft, trying to beat their way through the fuselage. At that point, he simply stopped, froze. Flight attendant Debbie Griffiths immediately thinks of the Lockerbie disaster. This instant sort of terror, if you like, and my first thought was, is there a bomb? A huge bang and heavy vibrations rock a British Midland flight en route to Northern Ireland. Sitting in a window seat over the wing in row 14 is healthcare worker Gareth Jones. He's busy dealing with a panicking fellow passenger. The lady that was next to me, Teresa, was distressed, so I started to talk to her to, to try and, and, and calm her, but also to help me because it wasn't uh, stress-free for me either. Gareth has good reason to be worried. His seat gives him a clear view of the plane. She was on standby, but managers called her in at short notice. She's been a flight attendant for two years. I loved the job, basically because I, I really enjoyed meeting the people. It was, a, it was a great lifestyle for somebody of that age. Within minutes of takeoff, the cabin crew start the drink service. With the hold-ups behind them, there's a light-hearted atmosphere. Passengers know they'll be on the ground in under one hour. Eight oh five p.m. Thirteen minutes into the flight, the aircraft is climbing through eight thousand five hundred meters on its way to a cruising altitude of ten thousand six hundred meters. Then, without warning, a massive bang. The aircraft starts to vibrate violently. A routine flight turns into every air traveler's worst nightmare. Up on the flight deck, Captain Hunt and First Officer David McClelland feel the vibration. What's going on? Much worse, they smell smoke. What's going on? We've got, we've got a fire coming. Tell ATC we need to start at this end. Smoke can only get into the cabin by the air conditioning ducts. And since the aircon is jet powered on the 737, they deduce its engine trouble. And it sounds serious. 20 year old student, Kieran Dynan. Europe. England. London Heathrow. The world's busiest international airport. January 8, 1989. It's a Sunday evening, and many passengers are headed home after the Christmas and New Year holidays. The airport is packed. In Terminal 1, passengers check in for British Midland Flight 092 to Belfast, Northern Ireland. It's a regular, hour-long commuter shuttle. Security is tight. It's the height of the IRA's terrorist campaign against British targets. The IRA has killed 416 civilians in nearly 20 years of violence. Healthcare worker Gareth Jones started a new job in Belfast three weeks ago. Security checks are a way of life. 
if you lived in, in Northern Ireland at the time, you got quite used to security. It was a period when there was heightened security there. You look after yourself, right? You look after mother. Thank you. Bye. The IRA isn't the only reason for Heathrow's high security. Lockerbie, Scotland. Three weeks earlier, a terrorist bomb blows apart a Pan Am 747 flying from Heathrow to the US. The explosion kills all 200 of his aircraft is still new to him. He's clocked just 23 hours. First Officer McClelland has 53 hours. All pressure's rising. The seat belt's on there, in the main cabin, Gareth Jones has a window seat over the wing in an emergency exit row. Excuse me, sir. A flight attendant asks Gareth to read the safety card so that he knows how to open the overwing exit door. Normally, it was pretty blasé about it, but it was pleasantly done and um, it would have been ill mannered not to. Air traffic control clears flight 092 for takeoff. 092 is clear for takeoff, 27 right, surface winds 270 degrees. Weather conditions are perfect. Have we go? Let's go. First Officer McClelland throttles the engines up. D1, rotate. Positive climb. And gear up. Gear up. Seven fifty two PM British Midland Flight zero nine two is airborne and on its way to Belfast. Debbie Griffith, age twenty four, is one of six cabin crew on board tonight. Fifty nine people on board and eleven more on the ground. It's the worst ever terrorist attack on a US airliner. The authorities suspect it's the work of an Arab terrorist group. We'll do the before start checklist down the line Today, the passengers on flight 092 are in the hands of 43-year-old Captain Kevin Hunt. He's one of British Midlands' most experienced pilots, with 25 years flying under his belt. Air conditioning and uh, pressurization packs on flight. Flying with him, 39-year-old First Officer David McClelland. Tonight, they're flying an aircraft just two months old. It's one of Boeing's new 737-400 series. Boeing launched the aircraft a year earlier in a blaze of publicity. It boasts significant improvements over its predecessors. Its new CFM 56 engines are the most powerful of their kind. And the cockpit display features state-of-the-art technology, including computerized TV screens and LED dials, which replace the traditional mechanical gauges. 7.15 p.m. Boarding cars, please. 118 passengers board the brand new plane and take their seats. Brakes release, then you are clear to push, we're going to start engines two and one on push. Captain Hunt starts up the two engines. The 400C 